Um, and I'm Jerry Hernandez, Vice President of Turning Point Castle. We just wanted to do a brief introduction. And, uh, yeah. And then I know Professor Ratz. You want to say a few words? Oh, I, I think. Oh, I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll do for a living. And you were thinking, oh, this is going to be a long peroration. No. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations to Turning Point, a group that took Towson's promise of fairness almost shattered by about 25 irresponsible faculty and becoming a great flux of its numbers, its belief, and its courage. I shall not mention by name the immature and anti freedom of speech faculty because that <coughs> would not be very nice to Desiree Rowe <coughs> and Jessica Schiller. <laughs> and so I, I won't waste your time advising you to avoid such faculty. Of course, I, you know, I, because you don't know who they are. <laughs> but I really want to compliment you to be brave about this club of excellent conservative young students on the great path you have followed in solidifying the group behind the right academic and ethical values. I put my own reputation on the line supporting you, but I had no doubt that you would come through, although even I was surprised at how well you came through. So congratulations and forward hope turning point. Congratulations. I love you. While you may loathe populism, populism is becoming very popular, said Nigel Farage in his final address at a European Parliament in January of 2020. Since 2008, dozens of populist parties, left and right wing, have gained prominence throughout the Western world as anti-establishment sentiment has grown tremendously since the financial crisis of 2008. Right wing populist parties have taken over governments in Poland, Hungary, and Italy, Populist presidents took office in America, Mexico, and Brazil, and right-wing populist parties are polling higher than they had in the last half century in France, Germany, and Austria. Increasingly, more and more people are beginning to call themselves populists and support populist candidates. But what really is populism? What does it mean to be a populist? Is it being anti-establishment? Is it being pro-worker? Is it being anti-rich or anti-elite? Is it being anti-big business or anti-big government? Is it being libertarian? Is it being a nationalist? To discuss all of this and define what populism is and what it means to be a populist, joining us tonight is the one and only John Doyle, ready with patriot, and Jordan Jackson. We are grateful to have co-hosting this event with us. All right, if you guys want to introduce yourselves, tell us what you do, and your favorite populist figure. Uh, my name is John Doyle. I complain about politics on the internet for a living, <laughs> more or less. Uh, I work with different organizations, different uh, student organizations, different political figures, things like that. Uh, my favorite populist figure, I guess maybe wouldn't even be in the traditional sense a populist, though the way that we use the word now would probably be so, and I'm sure we'll get into that. It'd probably have to be Pat Buchanan. Um, I'm ready for politics. I run a YouTube channel, also a political analyst, and I'd say that overall, my favorite populist figure would be Donald Trump. I mean, he's the one spearheading this movement that we're seeing nationwide on the right, and it's a great thing to see. All right, guys. I'm Colby. Uh, I post stuff on the internet, everybody, and I, you know, do some work with some populist groups, not very big, like Jackson Project, pretty cool people. And my favorite <clears throat> populist figure, probably either Donald Trump, because of all the reasons that he just said, or like Huey Long. Was all right, so before we start, I'll break down how this is going to work. We have five topics for tonight, spanning from economic to foreign policy and many other uh, areas. I will ask one of you a question about a topic, and then you will give and explain your stance and the populist take on that topic. And then the other two speakers will have a chance to give their take, and 
and why they agree or disagree with what another speaker said. We will spend 10 minutes on each topic, and when you hear the alarm ring, we will move on to the next topic. After the last topic, each speaker will be given a chance to make their final minute-long concluding statement, followed by a 30-minute Q&A session. After that, we'll take pictures. <laughs> Any questions before we start? That's good. All right. Here we go. First topic. As I mentioned earlier, different people have different takes on what it means to be a populist. Some interpret it as being power to the people, others have a more nationalist take, and others have a simply anti-establishment take. So my very first question to you is, what does populism mean to you? And Jack, we'll start with you first. Um, well, I mean, to me, it means policies, and obviously politician when it comes to the electoral politics sense, that will help the American people, will revitalize the American dream. And I think it means a lot of different things to a lot of people, because I think a lot of people have a different view of what, I guess you would say, the people, what, what's best for the people. But in reality, I think that the form of populism that we're seeing, especially on the right, is national populism. You see the fact that you have you know, Donald Trump and his movement. He wants to bring our jobs back. He wants to secure our border, lower immigration overall. And those are populist things that would put the American people first. So I would have to say two words, America first. You guys are more than welcome to give your take and then uh, say whether or not you agree or disagree with one another. I agree with a lot of that. I, I think that when we use the word populist nowadays, it's because we are so impotent and defeated as a right in this country that when Donald Trump ascends to the scene, we sort of look at what he's doing and we want to brand that, kind of condense Trump as a figure into an ideology or a template that can be replicated and plugged into other candidates or elections. Um, and we sort of had in this country, uh, like my friend based Colby here mentioned, a, a good tradition of populist candidates, whether it's you know Huey Long or Ross Perot or Pat Buchanan, even Bernie Sanders by some metrics. Um, but someone like Donald Trump really is not a populist, he's actually more of a nationalist. And the reason I think people like to call him a populist or a national populist is because our understanding of nationalism in this country is this very sort of George Bush era, we're gonna wave the American flag, we're all gonna get drunk and sing Sweet Carolina at the baseball game, but it really doesn't make any firm declarations on what it means to be an American and who gets to be an American. And that makes a lot of people uncomfortable because our immigration policy since 1965 has allowed virtually anybody to come here and be an American. And we've seen very recently the results of what that does. I mean, we're told these people will come here because they love us because of our freedom. And then all of a sudden these ancient ethnic blood feuds kick off and now our college campuses are getting flooded. Our cities are getting flooded and we're scratching our heads like, wait a minute, I thought we all subscribe to like liberal democratic values. What's going on here? And with someone like Donald Trump, they've tried to take that and the GOP establishment loves this. You know, they're not afraid of the idea of populism because that's just a way for them to do what they do as a party, which is not to represent us, but to contain us. And so if we're populist, ooh, we're anti-elitist, ooh, it's really not that threatening because they'll take what Trump was about, which is about identity, which is about nationalism, putting American people first. You know, he didn't come out and descend from the golden escalator and give his speech about how we need to have industrial policy, bring back, you know, X, Y, Z. It was really like, we need a wall because why is America looking the way that it does? You know, I don't even understand what it means to be in my own country anymore. It was really focused on identity. And I think that the GOP establishment has largely tried to move away from that and reduce it to things that are more, you know, about uh, manufacturing policy and things of that nature, which are true. But ultimately what it means to be a populist means to put power to the people. And that would have worked really well for us maybe a century ago. But now we have so many people in this country who aren't supposed to be here. So you have a lot of people on the left who consider themselves populist because strictly speaking, populism is a left-wing ideology. The idea that you are going to bring power to the people, that is liberal, that's democratic. I mean, people who are right-wing tend to believe in hierarchy and elitism, which is to say people have different abilities, different natural abilities. They excel in certain areas, they're weaker in other areas. And so the way that the right is populist now isn't because we all of a sudden believe that the people can somehow rise up and take the country back. It's a way of recognizing that our elite class, which isn't to just say the government, because for a very long time it was, well, the government is the bad guys. Now we're realizing it's not just the government, it's the academic system, it's big business, it's big tech, it's all of these other apparatuses in this country who are run by elite figures. 
they are all hostile to American people. And so we use populism, in my opinion, as sort of a political mechanism, a tactical mechanism to say, we're finally recognizing that the people who are pulling the strings, whether they work for the DHS, or whether it's Joe Biden, or someone in his cabinet, are ultimately not just incompetent, but hostile to Americans. Because if you were just incompetence, you'd expect one, that they sometimes get it right, and then two, when they get it wrong, they would be accountable and apologize. They do neither of those things. They consistently get it wrong to the point that it's, it's, a, it's beyond chance. I mean, it's obviously intentional, um, and they never apologize. And they even like celebrate it or gaslight you into thinking that what is happening is not what is actually happening. So uh, I think ultimately populism is a good idea in the short term, but we really do have to stress the national component, which is to say we're not populist in the way that the left are populist, where it's like, we want power to the people, because then they're going to define the people as anybody. I mean, they would make the argument largely that what's going on with the Israeli-Palestine conflict is a populist movement against Israeli colonialism and things like that, because they just view that to be an extension of Western civilization, this idea that you've got uh, you know, a colonist state that's oppressing the poor minorities or the poor brown people, which is how they view all of global conflict. So we really have to be careful, I think, with our definitions, because we want to take that sort of short-term, uh, I guess, at advantage of using, using populism, but then it's going to come back to bite us, you know, flying too close to the sun because we're going to form coalitions with people who ultimately are not actually good on the issue. So I think we have to just ultimately be very careful and make sure that it's not about some abstract ideology. It's really very simple, and we just have to put Americans first. And as long as we keep that in our, I think, uh, sort of ultimate worldview, it doesn't have to be reduced to an ideology or these complex policy platforms. It, it really is as simple as like, is this advancing the interests of the American people or is it not? All right, so to go off of John's 15 minute, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna say to be a populist, it means, right, he said like, you know, you know power the people, right? But with all the immigration and mass migration that's with all these people that are not Americans and don't have good t intent for America, um, it really, being a populist, it just means you gotta put, you gotta put your people first, right? Not all these immigrants who are stealing our jobs and other things like that, but really just means, you know, like things like, you know, getting, oh, I'm sorry, but like, like people like coal miners who, you know, are getting way underpaid and they're, bas they're basically fueling like, if you like electricity, I mean, you know, people like that are the reason that we have nice conveniences like that and I think some of them are being underpaid and I think there are a lot of job a lot of good jobs are being, being taken by migrants and I think you just need to put the people first and not be worrying about like things like Israel like people like countries like Israel and Ukraine I just think we need to focus on America put America first and I think you know, everything else will resolve itself once we do that. I like to interject. My bad. I think that Ukraine is probably a very important right-wing position to have. This is the most right-wing friendly country in the entirety of Europe. Russia has been supporting and bankrolling every single far left movement the past, I don't know, 30 years in Eastern Europe. Why is the populist movement latching on to such a hostile action? We'll have a chance for Q&A afterwards. Okay. I would save your question for the end. Sure. All right. Anyways, other than that, that's basically it. Yeah, I mean, the means to an end part is pretty important, as John said, because uh, we don't believe that we should not have an elite. We are right wingers. We believe in hierarchy. The problem is the current elite is not working in the favor of the American people, so we need to replace them with an elite that does, and I think that populism is not the end goal because it's not a stable position. We say power to the people. That's the left wing position. What does that exactly mean? That's what democracy, right? I mean, the people, by and large, are dumb. And that's kind of what we're seeing right now in this country. So overall, we need an elite, but we need an elite that's gonna work in the best interests of the people because the current elite does not. They're made up of dumb people, they're made up of incompetent people, and in most cases, they're dumb, incompetent, and evil. And that's a major problem that we have.
I think we have to be really important with the messaging too because there is a placating factor with the message of populism. And if you look at the way the history books are written, because they're all written by liberals and communists, all of their narratives are populist. They'll say that one day everybody just woke up and realized, wait a minute, why am I picking on this guy because he looks different than me? And then we had the civil rights movement. Everybody just woke up one day and thought, wait a minute, why can't two men get married? And then we have gay marriage now. That's never how these things work. It's always the organized minority defeating the disorganized majority. And then they write the history books because it's a very appealing narrative that everybody just woke up one day and was like, wait a minute, this is so correct and true and self-evident, obviously, but that's not how these things tend to work. And so if we play too much with the populist rhetoric, I worry that that will dissuade people from getting involved and getting organized because they'll kind of think, well, I'm going to a protest, I'm posting memes, this is all sort of contributing to the ecosystem, this is the people rising up, but that's never happened. I mean, you look at virtually any revolution, the people will contribute to it insofar as they, cre they create the sort of uh, discontent or entropy that can allow the conditions to exist for that organized minority to come in and usurp the authority of the incumbent regime, so to speak. Uh, this has happened in our own revolution, it happened in France, I mean, every, in Russia, um, and even speaking of Russia, and their psyops. There was something during the Russian Revolution, I think, that mirrored what we saw in 2020 with the whole QAnon, or I guess even prior to that, the QAnon phenomenon where we were being told to trust the plan. And that is sort of a placating message because that's telling American patriots, sit back, trust the plan. We've got guys who are working within the high ranks of government. They're gonna come in, they're gonna bring back JFK Jr. to life, and we're gonna install Trump as president on this day. And of course, that. Now, and by the way, if that does happen, I'll be the first to, you know, I'll get a Q tattoo right here. But I don't know if that's gonna We do have to move on to the next topic. Actually, that was our alarm. Oh, okay, let's see. All right. uh, uh, Russia, <laughs> Ukraine, and Israel were all mentioned uh, in this topic. But they do have a lot to do with our next topic, which is foreign policy. So, um, so there's been a lot of similarity that we've seen between left-wing populists and right-wing populists on foreign policy to some extent. Or, you know, left-wing and right-wing populists will have more in common with one another when it comes to foreign policy than they will with average conservatives, liberals, or moderates. So my question to you is, what does populist policy look like in terms of foreign affairs? And uh, Colby talked about that a little bit earlier, and uh, you can continue. All right, so populist policy and foreign affairs. Since if we're talking about strictly America, like it, our populist policy and foreign affairs, it would, since it's mostly nationalistic, I would say there isn't much of a there isn't a, much of a foreign policy to be had. But um, but you know we could we could instill things like that in other countries where they're. Uh, where the elites are in, up in some other countries where they're taking advantage and uh, not putting the people first because they're rich and greedy dirtbags. And it's, yeah, basically, gotta. But as far as populist policy, like for America in other countries, that makes sense. We also, I don't think we can't, just to kind of continue off that, we can't let the anti these wars rhetoric be co-opted by the anti-war movement in general we're not anti-war we just want wars that can reflect the interests of americans uh, like imagine if we actually had a competently functioning american empire where we did go to war in the middle east and we took all their oil and all of a sudden gas stays at under two dollars a gallon and every person in this room gets like a two thousand dollar stipend every year from shell oil is like hey you know dispensing that patronage back to it. that's how empires historically would actually run you know we go steal resources pillage and just bring it back for our people I'm not saying that's what we should do but that's certainly like better than what we're doing now where we're sending american dollars and american lives and we're getting nothing in return uh, the, the Middle East is getting, you know, their young girls to learn about feminism and gender theory and things like that. But Americans are getting nothing in return for these conflicts. So I don't think that we have any interest in wars uh, in, in Taiwan, in the Middle East, um, in Ukraine, certainly. Um, the gentleman mentioned that Ukraine is like one of the more right-wing countries, uh, perhaps. But ultimately, you know, I kind of look at the way the situation exists in Washington. And I know everyone there is my enemy. And all of a sudden, they are all in support of this, sending literally like tens of billions of dollars to this country just overnight in terms of the consensus that was formed. 
And so it's difficult for me to tell myself that I actually know something they don't. Nancy Pelosi is so silly, and all of her lobbyists and all of her donors, they're actually being stupid and falling right into my trap because Ukraine's actually like based in right wing, and so this is actually good. I don't think that's true. I think that Russia and China and countries like that are forming a coalition globally to try to impede the predominant American influence on the world. And that American influence is translating into things like anal sex and gluttony and feminism and gender theory and the genital mutilation of children. And so insofar as there is a force in the world that seeks to disrupt that sort of uh, global consolidation of power, I, I ultimately, I don't know if I support it, but I certainly don't support my friends going to die uh, trying to go fight those guys. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of wars that we've been fighting for the past 20, 30 years that have not been for a benefit. What war exactly would be fighting for a benefit? You know, I wouldn't be opposed to going into Mexico, squashing all the drug cartels that are causing the opioid crisis, and getting out of there within a week because we definitely have the manpower to do it. But instead, we're sending, you know, thousands of people to die overseas in this endless war on terror to export democracy and, you know, gay sex to these other countries that don't want it. They hate us more breeds more terrorism. We don't want that. We want to put the American people first. So we're not going to be funding these conflicts where we have no stake in, and we're not going to be going out there and fighting wars and having our own children die for countries and causes that are not beneficial and in many cases harm everybody. All right, so uh, we'll move on to the next topic. Uh, it is clear that protectionism and economic nationalism has been growing in popularity among Americans in both major political parties. Now, in 2016, both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump ran on anti nafta campaigns. And once taken office, President Joe Biden has kept most of President Trump's trade policies concerning China. So my question to you is, what does populist policy look like in terms of trade, industry, and manufacturing? And I know, John, you were talking about that earlier, so uh, we'll start with you. Sure, um, I think that the there's a sort of new, in the last, maybe it's only 50, 60 years old, this right-wing economic intellectual tradition, which has been very harmful in speaking about the way that our country and all countries have gained wealth throughout history. Uh, there's been no serious civilization that has ever become prosperous or wealthy without some form, uh, even a predominant form, of economic protectionism. Every person on Mount Rushmore is a protectionist or was a protectionist, and that's how our country became wealthy, that's how it can stay wealthy and become wealthy again. And so I support that, I support Donald Trump because of that. And, you know, there was a lot of very smart people who had very smart ideas about how we just open up the borders in terms of immigration and trade policy. We can lower the price of flat screen televisions and orange juice. Maybe that's true, but I think that America deserves to be more than just an economic zone where the ultimate good is just consuming at perhaps lower costs. Um, I think the quality of life that we get from those policies, maybe even if the TVs are cheaper, is ultimately not beneficial to American people. So yeah, what, what that would look like is allowing for, and this is why the, the metric of a GDP is not good because GDP might be growing, but look at the lifestyle inflation. Like, I might not have a degree from, I don't know, the U Chicago School of Economics, but I know that my dad can remember a country where if you just kept your nose clean, graduated from high school, and got a job, you could more or less afford a nice home in a safe neighborhood, a car, maybe two cars, you could more or less exist on one income. That's what his parents did, that's what my parents were able to do for a long time, and our generation just doesn't have that. And we can work harder, sure, uh, we can stop complaining, sure, that's what the older generations like to tell us, and there is certainly an entitlement that the millennial generation, the Gen Z people have, but there's also something to be said about the lifestyle inflation, where it's more difficult for us to just make those simple choices and stay focused on that route and be able to have the lifestyle that our grandparents had. And this is completely new in our country's history. I mean, it was the impetus of prior generations to leave more to their descendants than they had, and the opposite has happened since the boomer generation which is that we are being left with fewer opportunities and fewer, uh, I guess, uh, less mobility in terms of our quality of life, our economic standpoint. So I think that uh, the starting point with that would be securing our border, both in terms of immigration and economic policy and trade policy. Yeah, I mean, Donald Trump said it best. When was the last time you saw a Chevrolet in Tokyo? I mean, it's been a long time since we used to export. We used to be a net exporter across the world 
That hasn't been the case for a while. We have these massive trade deficits. We're sending manufacturing jobs overseas. We, you know, you used to be able to raise a family on one income with a, a high school education and nothing more, but we don't have that anymore. We don't have that in this country and we need to bring it back. And I think the first way we do it um, is obviously you talk about the labor market, having all these low skilled migrants coming and taking the jobs. You can't have that. You gotta instill an immigration moratorium of sorts, not just illegally, but also legal. Um, the corporations don't like that because the more labor they have, well, that's definitely going to help them lower wages. And that's something that uh, they're gonna use to their advantage. But overall, when it comes down to it, what we need is we need a, a trade policy of protectionism. We need selective tariffs across the board. That's how you used to have taxes. We didn't even used to have an income tax. We used to tax off of tariffs, but now it's just, you know, across the board, you see these free markets and it'll benefit certain countries where they can manipulate the currency, lower their wages overall. But when it comes to us, we're losing on every front. We got to change that. All right, so I think that the, in terms of industry and manufacturing, we got to stop for populist policy, of course. We got to stop shipping our jobs overseas to China for for uh, for much cheap for a lot of, for a lot cheaper when we make garbage products. And and I think America has the resources to make ninety percent of the things that we've been shipping over to China, like clothes. Like all of our clothes are probably made somewhere else. Right, and you probably got your clothes. I mean, they weren't—they probably weren't too expensive. But I feel like if we if we just brought our jobs back to America, I think it might raise the price of all your fancy clothes. But it'll—it sure will help out the people looking for jobs. Also, a lot of like I've been told by a handful of people that I'm supposed to go die in Taiwan because otherwise we're not going to have semiconductors. Who invented that technology? Like they might be able to make it now. We can certainly do that. I mean, I, I said this last night, I stand by this. We either put a man on the moon or constructed a propaganda apparatus sophisticated enough to convince the world that we did. That is American excellence. <laughs> you can't replicate that here. That is just absolute nonsense. And you know, honestly, oh, semiconductor shortage, why does my dishwasher have a chip in it? Why does my fridge have a chip in it? We're, we're just trying too hard. Chip short, stop putting chips in everything. You know, we have to be smart, but it's like, I'm gonna put a chip in everything, make everything smart. They replaced the, the lock in my apartment. It was a key, it's fine, everything works. Well, now it's got a chip and I get to type in an old passcode. Wow, I'm living in the future. It's like, now I have to go die in Taiwan because of that. And by the way, it takes longer. It doesn't even solve the problem, so yeah. yeah. All right, so I guess we're ready to move on to the next topic. Uh, interesting topic we have next. In 1992, Ross Perot ran a populist political campaign that took a sizable amount of votes from Republican nominee George H.W. Bush, which could have potentially been one of the things that cost him the election, and that handed the election over to Democrat Bill Clinton, who was president for the next eight years. During the 2022 midterm cycle, a number of populist MAGA Republicans won their primaries but ultimately underperformed against their Democrat opponents. RFK Jr. is currently running as an independent and has support from populist and conservative Democrats, as well as many voters who typically vote Republican. And he is not expected to perform anywhere nearly as good as Joe Biden or Donald Trump. During this 2022 congressional campaign, a certain Republican candidate from Washington State said that we should be open to working with left-wing populists and independent populists as opposed to just right-wing populists, in a strategy which he coined inclusive populism. He ultimately lost to, to the Democrat nominee. Other populistic figures, such as Tulsi Gabbard and Andrew Yang, performed poorly in their party primaries and haven't gained much traction as independents. My question to you, what is the best way of impacting populist change within our political system and within our country? When should we support independents? When should we primary incumbents? And should we be open to working with populists on the other side of the political spectrum? And Jack, I'll start with you. Well, I think that when it comes down to the candidates, the reason why a lot of people underperformed in 2022 was because they didn't have the money. They weren't funded by certain interests and you had the party apparatuses. They were going after them in the primaries. They were spending tens of millions of dollars against certain candidates. And a lot of them came short 
and failed, which means that I think it's a good sign that the movement's growing, but there wasn't any money left over in the general election to help them. So it's kind of a problem. You're gonna have to take back the party. You're gonna have to take back the apparatus. We're gonna need our own network of donors in order to go out there and kind of take this country back. And we don't really have that right now. So when it comes to primaries, I know that the you know knee-jerk reaction is this guy voted this way on this typical bill or whatever, you gotta primary him. And there's a lot of people I'd like to see primaried. I think some battles are more, I guess you'd say winnable than others. So uh, we kind of have to pick our battles when it comes down to the primary process. But I do believe that sometimes, like we saw the impeachment 10, for example, a lot of them got primaried or retired because they would lose primaries. That's a good thing. So we gotta go after the low hanging fruit when it comes to primaries, but also kind of build a bench, build up this apparatus where we're taking open seats in state legislatures so you actually have people that are learning the game of politics and they can go out there and be competent and win and we can rebuild the republican party to the point where you know you don't have a lot of people out there who are very conservative very i guess you'd say populist in like the trump sense that say that they're embarrassed to be from the republican party just because of the republican establishment is so weak yeah, I think at the state level, we could do ourselves a lot of favors by, because a lot of these red states, you know, like Ron DeSantis, for example, was getting hyped up as like this epic right-wing governor, and he did a lot of great work, but we have a lot of red state governors who are just doing terrible jobs, and like, you know, DeSantis had significant majorities in both chambers of state Congress, and he did a lot, but it's like, anyone could have probably done that they just gotten their act together you know. in a matter of yeah and so we just don't do that and it's pretty easy actually because this is why we lose is because we are disorganized but that also provides good opportunity because it means that for people who want to enact change within local party infrastructure you get in you shake some hands you smile and wave you're a normal guy you're cool and well adjusted you don't believe anything radical but pretty soon you have power locally that is very important because if you can make red states redder Pretty soon, it's a lot easier to get, you know, actual conservative involved in, you know, positions, whether it's at the state house, what have you, at the federal level, in Congress. And there are ways to do this. Liberals are very good at making blue states blue or purple states blue. Conservatives aren't because we tend to just want to be left alone. But even something, for example, like passing laws, making like possession of marijuana a felony, like why would you do that? It's a plant. Let people do what they want. I don't care about people smoking marijuana. What I care about is that liberals will see that and be like, I don't want to move there, man. Like, pigs love. That's why the whole like you know pro weed movement it began because white collar professionals wanted to just like get high in their garage and not have to worry about the police rolling up on them. That's why it was cities like Denver, Seattle, Portland, what have you that began. And now it's like, oh, we all realize it's true. If red states like clamp down on things like that, or uh, you know the laws affecting what is being taught to children whether or not we're going to allow parents to have their children take these hormones, things like that, which are not huge issues in the sense that they occupy like, oh wow, this is affecting everybody. But they're these little like culture war things that people think are insignificant, but it gets into the libtard mind and they're like, well, I don't want to move there, I'm gonna leave. This is like literally 1984. Adolf Hitler is my governor now. And it's like, then they move out of the state and it gets better. <laughs> and this is good, we need that to happen. Um, the original oh yeah <laughs> allying with left-wing populists you can have coalitions on the right you can have your libertarians and your paleo-conservatives your neocons and, well, maybe not them but <laughs> you have these you know alliances the problem with allying with people across the side of the that's like an entire axis that you're because people who are on the left have an entirely different view of the world we have a common talking point it makes people feel very smart, very undifferent, but it's like, well, both parties are really the same. That's true in a political sense because neither party really reflects the interest of its voters. We get the regularly scheduled programming no matter who's elected to office, but that doesn't actually mean that philosophically it's different. The right views the world in a much more natural, skeptical sense. We're skeptical of human nature. We understand that there are differences between people. The left doesn't view it that way. The left believes Tabula rasa, blank slate. Everybody's the same, and the only thing that can make people different is environmental factors and experiences and things like that, and that's why we need the state to come in and make everybody square one equal, and that way we can have this egalitarian utopia. If you believe that, like, I don't really care if you, like, are vaguely upset at the elites. You are so stupid, it would be irresponsible for me to give you a position of power. Why would you ally with somebody like that? And that's what's happened. We've tried to form these, you know, oh, 
wow, what if everyone could just come together and like look at where that got us? We are now on the back foot defending issues like maybe children shouldn't have their you know, genitals mutilated because we've tried to form these coalitions with people who are ultimately completely incompatible with our worldview. And so I think we just need to starve the GOP. Finally, just stand up for ourselves and be like, okay, you don't want to put our guys in office? Fine. Now you're going to lose elections. You're going to lose donor money. We're going to take it away from you, etc. Because ultimately, we've got like a window here. And if we're going to lose, I'd rather lose on our feet than just keep giving these guys money so that they can live in the gated communities like Brazil, where we have to live in the favelas. Uh, I'd rather just all go down together uh, by standing up for what is right, what we know is true. Yeah, I mean, there's no teaming up with these a lot of these left-wing populists because a lot of them are like the Antifa members. They hate white people, they hate traditional values, they hate you. They're not gonna vote for someone with any conservative value because they will cave into every single corporate special interest before they're gonna let go of their woke ideology. It's just not going to happen. And we'll, that's important, by the way, it's such a great point. When they say they hate elites, it's because they think that the elites, the people running this country, are like, you know, like country club watchers. That's like what, when they think <laughs> elites, they think like a normal Christian guy wearing like a Ralph Lauren polo. Like that's what they're saying when they're saying elites. Mm -hmm. And if you were like, wow, the elites have flooded the country with immigrants. Well, all of a sudden, that left wing would come out pretty quick. Well, what's wrong with that? When they're and then all of a sudden now you just want to like kill yourself. So you should not form those alliances. I don't think. All right, so I think um, one of the ways we can get uh, populist leaders and you know, people in the office is, or one of the reasons, or I should say one of the reasons that we aren't getting people into things like this is because a lot of them, a lot of them, a lot, there's a lot of people who are just, who are just happy farmers and underpaid lower class people who are, who just, who just want to be paid more, you know, like coal miners and farmers, lots of farmers. And, you know, and as far as the left wing coalition goes, no coalitions with those guys. 90% of them are just, are what John said, just, or well, one of them said, I don't remember. They just, they hate white people. They don't like Christian people. They, a lot of them are just people you don't want to be around. And if we, if we, we don't want to mold in with them, we got to stand our ground and double down. So. All right, so our final topic before we go into the concluding statements. Now you guys have alluded to this throughout the evening. Is populism a means to an end or an end within it, within of itself? Uh, John, if you want to start. I suppose it's a, it's a means to an end. We have to be careful with the means. Uh, it's sort of like, you know, maybe a fairy tale bargain. Some sort of like architect like, wow, this is like so good. I'm gonna eat, but then it betrays you. It's like, you know, when you, the genie or something, you make a wish and then you like die or something. So we have to be very careful with it because if we're not, then people at the tactical level are going to be dissuaded from getting involved. We're going to form alliances with people who are going to screw us over at the higher levels, the more strategic levels. Um, so I think ultimately it's just a means to an end because like, like I said in the beginning, Historically speaking, we've never had a revolution, which isn't to say, you know, everybody got together and we fought off the government and now we have like total utopia, a, a change of power. We have, like right now, for example, like we mentioned with the regularly scheduled programming, the people in power don't have to worry about who gets in office. They know, you know, there might be some performative battle over tax cuts or abortion, but in terms of really what's changing this country, be it the immigration policy, trade policy, foreign policy, that's been a consensus for the last 40, 50 years. We would like to achieve a right-wing incumbent consensus where we don't have to worry about whether our values are being reflected. If we lose a presidential election, it's really not gonna mean too much because we know that we have enough power built up throughout our country in its institutions that it's not gonna you know, be our, our death. If for four years we have to deal with someone like Barack Obama or Joe Biden. So I think we have to just understand that there is a very important right-wing intellectual tradition which speaks about this, how to go about actually getting power, organizing, forming these coalitions, uh, because the right sort of has this very, it's kind of like a pouting teenager where we're like, you know, I'm just gonna like, you know, sit back and I'm gonna do whatever and eventually we'll take power. And it's like, we're not gonna do that. You're not, well, I'll just fight off the government. I'll just like die, I'll just, you know, I don't care. It's, we have to be focused. We have to look at the big picture of things. It's a long-term solution. And it starts by getting organized, forming coalitions of people who are good on the issues, like-minded, 
and we get distracted, I think, by a lot of things that are ultimately of no importance. And we, as people who love America and are conservative, fall into a well-meaning tendency to try to form coalitions with these people, because ultimately we want America to come together. We want to invite people to the 4th of July barbecue, but you have to understand, these leftists are not your grandparents, you know, maybe Bill Clinton Democrats. Like these people are driven by nothing more than resentment and any ideology or policy platform is all just window dressing. That's why these people are miserable. That's why they look the way they do. That's why you look at the mug shots of Antifa people, why they all look the same. Your, your brain is telling you this person looks dangerous because they are. These are people who are driven by resentment and hatred for like Jordan Peterson says, existence for itself. And they're trying to punish what they regard to be the good, the beautiful, which is America, Western civilization, by lashing out against it. And you know, any sort of coalition you form with those people because maybe they don't like elites or they don't like the system of government we have now, that's ultimately just to say they want it to be even worse and more destructive. Like there's a thing I see on social media very often from white uh, right wing people where they'll post a video of uh, these like based Muslims who are mad at Joe Biden. It's like, you understand what that means is not that they all of a sudden like want to read Thomas Paine. It's that they want someone who's even more left-wing than divide or something like that. Like we try to form these coalitions with groups of people who have been traditionally left-wing. Like, oh wow, even the, the Democratic Socialists of America, they're mad at Joe Biden. Well, because they want somebody like AOC or Rashida Tlaib or Ilhan Omar. Like they want somebody who's even farther left. These people are not aligned with reality. They are not reliable narrators. If they see leftism being done insufficiently they're not right wing what do they say well that wasn't real leftism so we have to be very dangerous or very careful with these types of people because they are uh, ultimately dangerous yeah i think the means to an end thing is accurate because like i said it's not a sustainable type of thing if you actually take back the country from the elites you have a system of new elites in power the way we would like you're going to have a new group of people who's going to be angry at those elites, and if they just stay in populism, the cycle will continue and they will overthrow the good elites because they'll believe that they stand for things that are bad and then vice versa. It's just not a sustainable uh, type of philosophy in and of itself to the point where, in my view of populism, national populism, you would replace the elite with one that puts America first. And like John said, you would have a conservative consensus from that point forward, but we don't have that right now. So that's why you're seeing this rise of populism and populist movements, but we do have to be careful about how we go about it. The left right now, they play for keeps. They will get what they want, they will double down, they will always demand more, and we're gonna have to do the same thing in order to maintain that consensus because they've been winning right now and we could possibly learn a thing or two from them. All right, so is it a means to an end? Yes and no, right? So no, because we want to, we always want to serve a pe serve the people and put America first, right? But yes, because we need, if we're going back to the hierarchy thing, we need to, we need to elect somebody who's going to, who's going to put America first and look out for the, look out for our people, like our people that are here, you know? That'd be like shutting down the border and not going over to other countries. Not saying that these other countries we're sending all our money to aren't good, but there is no real there is no real benefit for um, for America and American people who are funding this and with their tax dollars, hard earned money. Um, yeah, we just need someone that'll serve us and put us first. To give a more practical example, too. There's a very popular line of argument on the right that tells young people who are smart and capable that they should go into trades as opposed to go to college. Because if they go to college, they might become brainwashed. If you go to college and you buy into like the Marxist conditioning, you probably weren't going to make it anyways. We need right-wing people talking about becoming prosecutors, talking about becoming people of status, people of power, people of means. It's very low aspiration to say that we need a bunch of right-wing plumbers. I'm not, by the way, dissuading blue-collar work. Again, I complain about politics on the internet. I don't, you know, I'm a fan of honest work. I don't even know if what I do is a real job. So I'm just saying, I'm not saying that that's like the ultimate aspiration to be like a right-wing e-boy, though I do think there's some righteous components to it. But it is to say that if we want that right-wing elite class, you know, I don't want to just sit here and be like, oh, we need to, to get organized, be elite. It is to say things like that. Go through the university path. 
that is how you access the upper classes. That's how you access sort of elite status, become a prosecutor, become a doctor, become a successful businessman. If we sort of kneecap ourselves by being like, oh, well, I don't know if I want to go into debt. Well, I don't know if I want to have to, you know, argue with professors about communism. Just get in, get out. You know, you sometimes people want to prove something and argue with the professor. It's a lot easier if you just go along, say whatever, get the A, get the piece of paper. Doesn't mean the same thing as it does when T.S. Eliot got one, but if that is what you have to do to become a person who is in a position to then, when your MK Ultra trigger word, Operation Patriot, is uttered and you can become a member of that new organized right wing elite class majority, that is ultimately going to be good. And again, that's not to just wage blue collar work, it's not to say that it's somehow like, you know, less good than somebody who goes to get some fancy degree. It's just to say ultimately, if we want that organized elite to be in a position, that is ready to occupy power uh, if and when that time comes in our lifetime, we have to be there. You know, we're not gonna have some coalition of you know, welders and plumbers who are all of a sudden gonna occupy Washington. Uh, even, you know, look at our founding fathers, for example. These guys were aristocrats. They had to beg George Washington to come become president, lead the Continental Army. It's like, I have a plantation, I'm, I'm like vibing. I'm like literally like a very wealthy, intelligent guy. Look at Donald Trump, same thing, billionaire, whole life was like, eh, maybe I'll get involved in politics. He finally does it. It's like, these are guys who are capable, and that's the problem with conservatives. If we are naturally capable, we tend to go do other things. I'm gonna go run a business, be a lawyer, do whatever. Left-wing people, because they're driven by resentment, they make that their whole identity, being involved in politics. You know, the bumper stickers, I voted, things like that. And so <laughs> we have to encourage our young people not to sort of handicap themselves and be like, oh, you're gonna make me read about more gender theory than I had to read about when I was in public education anyways, well, I'm just gonna go be a plumber or something like that. It's like, that's good if you wanna do that, that's great, but it's not doing us any favors in the long term to tell that to our young people. Yeah, I think it depends how capable you are. You know, not everybody's gonna be able to go out there and be a politician, be an attorney, be whatever, but I mean, I guess I'd rather have somebody with like an IQ of 90 going and being a welder than like getting into all of this debt. But if they're more than capable, yeah, they should be, you know, going to college. They shouldn't shy away from it. You gotta fight within the system and take the system back. I mean, there's no other way. All right, so now we will have your final minute long concluding statements to pretty much wrap up everything you were saying, your whole position on populism, what it means to be a populist, et cetera. And uh, John, we'll start with you, then we'll go to Jack and the the type of person who works in politics in the GOP is a mix between a theater kid and like a total, you've got these people who just love LARPing. They love doing the live action role plays. Like, oh, I'm a real political person. I'm like a fancy guy. And there's a lot of ego involved in there. And these are people who have gone out of their way to make it very difficult for people like myself to do our jobs because they're threatened by what that sort of new right wing is going to look like because it won't allow them to be a part of the club because they ultimately have no conviction, they have nothing behind their eyes, they're probably not even real people, but they are allowed to exist in this country and they are allowed to make money because they don't exist to represent the interests of the American people. They exist purely to distract and to contain us. If the country were running as it should, I would have gone to law school and done something else, but I was like, okay, I'll do this, that's why I'm here, you know? Because I believe in this country, I believe in its people, and I'm tired of seeing what is happening. I understand I've been around here that long, I'm only 23, but I, I've seen enough to where I wanted to get involved. And so I think that young people should be doing that generally. And uh, you're gonna have to deal with a lot of horrible people if you are good on the issues. You're gonna deal with them trying to cancel you, uh, blacklist you, things of that nature, but you ultimately just have to bide your time, stay focused, and if we do that, enough people do that, then we can truly make America great again. So I'm optimistic on the basis of that. Yeah, and like I said at the start of the first segment, two words, America first. We have to put the American people first. That's how we take back this country, our leaders on not just the Democrat side, but also our own side have strayed far too long in a way from that message and we need to you know start by this resurgence of you know american identity american nationalism and i guess the whole populism thing kind of does tie into that too so either way we got to put the american people first we got to secure our border cut immigration bring the troops home do all that stuff that's a big big portion 
of what we need to do. So we need to take this country back. And I think it starts with taking the Republican Party back because it's a feasible, viable thing to do. And we got to take it back from the local level, then the state level, then hopefully the national level. And if we're able to go out there and do it, we will actually have leadership. And I understand that it's not going to happen overnight. This could be a process that takes decades among decades. And I think we've made some progress, but we also have a long way to go. So we have to just keep fighting the good fight and go from there. All right, so basically, to piggyback off of what they said, but basically, you know, you got to put this whole populism thing. It's all about putting America first, American people first, you know, bringing the troops home, as he said, because there's no reason we need American troops to go fight in a big proxy war that just makes corporate elites and government politicians lots of money, right? And it just doesn't make any sense to me why we have to do things like that. We got to bring all the, we got to bring all of our jobs, we got to bring all the jobs back home, and we yeah, need to get all the immigrants out um, and close the border. And, you know, we can make, and we can make all this stuff here. Like, as John said, like, we can make the superconductors here. Right? Like, and we can find a lab somewhere and just start making superconductors, obviously. But, yeah, basically, America. All right. Round of applause for you. All right, so now we will be going into a 30-minute roughly a 30 minute Q&A session. Uh, pretty much how it's gonna work is, I'm gonna call on you, I'm gonna ask a question, you know how it works. There's no mic for this. It's gonna be just like a classroom. All right, Henry, would you like to start us off? Of course. All right, hi. Um, just to preface, I am not a left winger. I despise these people. My entire life work has been to destroy these people in any shape and capacity. But one thing I have a major problem with with the American populist movement is the hatred towards uh, Ukraine and Taiwan. Um, the thing is that we are not wasting our money. We are only spending 1.7% of our entire annual budget on defense of Ukraine, and we've stopped Putin's army in his tracks. Putin isn't ideological. He will one day say gay marriage should be banned, and then right-wingers in the West will clap profusely, and then the very next day he'll say racists need to be shot in the street. I think that it is very disgusting that we are letting these dictators, you know, march around just because they have vague anti-LGBT rhetoric. Does that mean we have to stand with literal communists? I mean, today in Catalonia, there was, there was radical left-wing Antifa's waving Russian flags and trying to <laughs> attack Spanish police. Like, it is completely beyond me how you people can, like, think these types of things just because Putin's like, whoa, whoa, marriage between man and a woman, no shit. Everything makes leftists upset. But compromising your principles, standing with literal communists, I think is absolutely treasonous. How would you respond to that? I think that no one wants to stand with Putin. We just don't want to send money to Ukraine. But we're not. We don't have to take it. So we send tens of billions of dollars. We're not sending billions of dollars. We're not printing money and putting it onto a pallet and sending it on a C5 galaxy so Zelensky rolls around it in a bathtub. That's absolutely not what's happening. Are you what we are military? doing is, huh? Are you in the military? Uh, I'll get into that later. First of all, I would like to tell you this, that we are sending surplus equipment. We are not sending brand new, fresh off of the production line of Boeing's, like brand new F-16 fighters. We are sending weapons such as the Bradley, the M1 Abrams that were built back in the late 70s, early 80s, used in the Gulf War. Yeah. And they have been decommissioned and were on the path to being destroyed until this war came along. And then they're now doing what they were originally designed to do which is to kill Russians. We, every single dollar, you can trace it back to a piece of military hardware, and there is transparency between the United States government and the Ukrainian government. Every single dollar, there is, there is no proof of how to say it, that these weapons are getting into the hands of criminals and to radical Muslims, to Israel, any of this type of stuff. This is all just a bunch of rhetoric from the anti-American left and the anti-American right, essentially. We are just giving old equipment that was originally due for the scrapyard that we were just going to throw away, and now we're sending it to Ukraine to defeat our enemy. And on top of that, the military industrial complex this year, and this is not even money we're losing, they have a 50% increase in profits this year because our allies have been shipping their stocks off to Ukraine, and now they are purchasing brand new systems, and we are basically modernizing the entire NATO arsenal. Thank you. Are you in the military? <laughs> I have um, extensive. 
I'm in an NGO, so I do a lot of research with this type of stuff. Yeah. I've traveled to the country of Ukraine twice in my life, uh, once in 2021, once in 2020. I have met with actual soldiers from there. I live a third of the year in Eastern Europe. I, um, I basically, since this war started, I used to be like one of these like maggotards years ago. Then I became a groiper. Then I went down the wig now, wet rabbit hole. But now at this point, I'm just a pragmatic centrist because I saw that all of these different movements are essentially anti-American, just as much as Antifa, just as much I as the communists. Center. You guys, I don't think are very patriotic. I think you guys are masochistic because America did not become a global superpower for being isolationist. We became a superpower because we are interventionalist and we have the God-given right of the uh, military-industrial complex to yeah. protect us always. I think you might be autistic. <laughs> because, uh, you are wearing like military shorts and a hat and what appears to be Ukrainian propaganda. I think you're like literally- That's my national identity, but okay. You're Ukrainian? Yeah. Oh, it's yeah, so you're literally here telling me I'm not patriotic. You want us to send money and American lives to go fight your We're not sending conflict. American lives. We're not sending That's money. We're sending saying, surplus though. weapons. But why? That costs money, certainly, to ship No, it weapons. doesn't. Heavy artillery? No, it doesn't. We we're we're spending no, it doesn't. We actually million. saved $70 billion on our budget last year because we spent about $200 billion of our $816 billion that, budget. Though? Why would we want to increase tensions with Russia? Because they are communists, they support every so, single left-wing movement in so, the entire world. So, we cannot let these people win. Why? Because this is a victory for the radical left of the rest What's of the Ukraine world. What's Ukraine going to do for us when we start to collapse? Huh? What's Ukraine going to do for us? Are they going to start? They will have our backs back just like we had theirs. Yeah. Okay. That's so all you people are. You people are just communists. <laughs> that's all you are. No, that's why. That's why you said you know they're killing the people they were designed to. You're just like larping. The people like, money. You just want death. You're just not like bloodthirsty yes. because you're. Crazy. I'm voting for Biden. I support NATO at this point. Like yes. you guys are literally. Oh shit! Like oh shit! Like what? Oh god, sleepy like, Joe! Hate, Holy shit! Like, I hate leftists no matter what. <laughs> At the end of the day, but you know what? I hate communists in foreign countries even more because they are going to ship their ideology here. The it's not the 80s anymore. Maybe yes, it is. Yeah, it's not coming not back. 86 percent of the Russian military identify with the USSR. I have a genuine question. Standing with the radical do you know, left. Do you have a this is motherfucker. Actually, I have a patch of it. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. That was entertaining. I like that actually. It was interesting. Uh, any more questions? Uh, Chase, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I preface this question with I'm not super educated in like, foreign policy, but um, I consider myself conservative for like quite a while, and I sort of liked a lot of what you guys are saying. Of like, hey, let's not send our money to these foreign conflicts, get involved in foreign wars. My question is kind of particularly about like all like the Israel Palestine stuff, because I guess like. As as conservative, I don't really fully understand why just like supporting Israel seems to be like the default option um, among the right when like everything you guys are saying about how like we need to put our people first. I see in Israel like a country that is not very supportive of like of, like Christian values, for example, um, and also depending on who you ask, it's like. Innocent civilians in Gaza, so it's like I guess I just don't I, I don't understand like why we have to like I don't know what y'all's position is. I don't like, support foreign aid to Israel. Okay. I think that it's another conflict that's very complicated. I think that we need to stay out of it. I'm not pro Palestine. I'm definitely not pro Hamas, but we have to put the American people first. And I think the reason why you have so many people in like the boomer generation explicitly that is like very very pro-israel and all these politicians and the right wing even a lot of these populist politicians on the right tend to be pro-israel it's because the israel lobby is you know it's there it exists and they give a lot of money to these politicians and that's the way it is i mean people can deflect they can say you can't say that that's anti-semitic or whatever label they want to throw at it but it's genuinely true i mean look at the look at the money for it a lot of evangelicals in this country also believe that in order to be blessed, we have to bless Israel because of a misunderstanding of that verse in the Bible. Uh, and so they have a very, almost like our friend over there, like bloodthirsty support for Israel against the Arabic world and things of that nature. Um, and, you know, I believe in war in the sense that if a country can defend itself, it has a right to exist. But 
the way that we view rights traditionally, like I have a right to go about my business, you do not have a right to impede on that. I think Israel has a right to exist insofar as they, you know, like the last Palestine. Like, am I going to have a problem with that? Probably not. And there are a lot of guys on the right who are like, no, Palestine's actually based because they're like anti Israel. And it's like, you understand that, like, they also hate Christians and they hate because they don't view Israel to be a Jewish state necessarily. And so you've got a lot of guys on the right who are like, this is based because I. They view it to be an extension of Western colonialism, an extension of white. The way that like the left says we have a right to healthcare or housing, it's like entitled. We have a right to exist, therefore Americans must support us and come to bat for us and things of that nature. And ultimately I just don't see what the interest is, uh, therefore Americans in that conflict or in the Middle East, broadly speaking. All right. Other questions? Uh, go ahead, sir. So when it comes to populism, I know you guys were making like a separation between nationalism and populism. Should we keep any sort of populist movement? local just state while uh more national movement focus on the federal government there's a lot of things that like local government state government that we can work towards more easily than we can with federal things well i mean the ideology national is just the prefix i mean you can have nationalist policy at a local level or state level for example if you have like in arizona for example former governor would send these like shipping cartons or whatever to kind of build a makeshift wall per se. And that is a populist, a national populist policy that could be enacted at the state level. You verify, for example, is another one. So I think that just having solid conservative policy at the local level and the state level, and that kind of ties into that would you know, qualify what I would call populist policy enacted at those levels. Yeah, I think that uh, as long as, sort of like I mentioned in the opening statement, Americans are being put first the intricacies are less important. Um, I think it's really just that simple. Uh, it's pretty easy to tell usually with each issue if that's the case or not. I was gonna say, does anybody who hasn't asked the question wanna ask the question first? Okay, uh, we'll go there. So, you guys have been all around the country. Um, in my personal experience, I've had a lot of instances where people will tell me like, I'll tell them, like, oh, dude, there's so many liberals in my school. Dude, just move to the Midwest, you know? Like, there are not liberals over there. Bro, like, the streets are dirtier. Dude, just move to the Midwest, you know? Like, in the Midwest, everything is clean all the time. Dude, like, this girl I went on a date with had an only You know, dude, like, if you go to the Midwest, they'll all be, like, track lives, and you'll get very little. Yeah. So, so you ever been to the Midwest, buddy? Yeah, you know, we will censor this Midwest slam. Have you ever been to the Midwest? I've never been to the Midwest. I've never been to the, this is my, my question. Is the Midwest actually that good? And the second part of the question, is it a good thing for people from other parts of the country to move to the Midwest? Okay. Better than living I'm going to ask for the like manifest for the attendees of this event so that when the country collapses and we take power of the Great Lakes Federation, you will be disallowed from entering. <laughs> if our country collapses, my ass is going but to Florida. The, the sentiment of your question is definitely true. It's just a form of freedom. You know, it's like, oh, the cities are corrupted. Move to the countryside. And it's like, at a certain point, we have to stop retreating. Uh, the suburbs arguably was a form of retreating. A lot of the like anti-university sentiment is a form of retreating. And even like the national divorce discourse that we've seen a lot in the last year, two years, that's a form of retreating too. That's like the chef's kiss of American conservatism. Like you failed to conserve literally everything. And now finally, like the actual geography of the country, because it's just always retreating around. And honestly, there's that component. And then even, it doesn't even sound like you're gonna like really effective in combating the left from you know rural Michigan, rural Ohio. Probably not. Um, I think ultimately, and that's not to say that those areas aren't nice areas to live. I grew up in Michigan. I had a blast. I love it. But you know, cities are supposed to be like our civilization, sort of reflecting <coughs> its soul. And the fact that American cities are now sort of spoken about with this kind of uh, you know, sorry, you're going to want to avoid that. That's like shameful. That's embarrassing. So. I don't think that we should abandon the cities. I don't think we should be telling our people to just move to the middle of nowhere because as you've seen, Ruby Ridge, Waco, eventually if they want to come after you, they're going to come after you regardless of where you are. So you may as well be somewhere that is near civilization where you can actually be close to things, be effective, uh, and have a, a quality of life that is better than just being in the middle of nowhere. Because it is true, you're in the middle of nowhere, you're in the middle of nowhere. You know, I had stuff going on in Michigan that was cool. I moved to DFW, there's a lot going on there. It is cool, it's fun. 
Um, and ultimately, that's where civilization is. And I think that if we retreat from that, we're like, got my like base trad commune. Maybe like when things really hit the fan, but right now it's not totally over. So I think that when people do that, it's just a form of like cowardice or sort of retreatism. Yeah, I don't know what the tendency is. It's like a more libertarian philosophy that a lot of people on the right have that says, oh, we just want to be left alone. That's all what it is. Don't tread on me. But they let themselves get treaded on and we got to fight back. And sometimes you got to, um, you know, go right into the heart of the action and infiltrate and take our institutions back. Because whoever holds the levers of power in the institutions controls the culture, controls everything, controls politics, controls the country. And if we take those back, then we'll have to take our country back. But until then, just running away isn't going to solve all our problems. What if we just want to be like, eat, like you said, like just want to be left alone? But what if we're just fucking done with civil, like civilization? We're just like, I don't like people. I don't want to look at people except the one who I'm living with. I mean, if you want to live, you know, if you want to like live in the middle of nowhere, I mean, that's fine. But it's not going to help us take our country back. I'm sympathetic to that. It's it's kind of like uh, in Zulu when they're about to get like totally killed by these African warriors, <laughs> and the guy's like, "Why does it have to be us?" And he's like, "Cause we're here." Nobody else is. That's sort of how I view it, where it's like, yeah, it really sucks that we have to deal with this, but we're here. You're literally here at this event, which means you more or less probably get it, understand the problems in the country. So you are like the 1% in the sense that most people you walk by either don't care about politics or don't get it at a sufficient level where they could enact change. So every guy like you who's like, this is a lot, I just want to. I get that, but we need you, good guy. You know, <laughs> like really. So I would, uh, I would encourage you to perhaps rethink that. Yeah. All right. Uh, trying to go to the people who haven't asked the question yet, but uh, uh keep going. Um. So one of the things that didn't get brought up is healthcare. Just want to get um sort of everyone to be on healthcare. Personally, I'm more supportive of universal healthcare. I think a lot of the reasons that health benefits have been struggling like the Midwest because they don't really have like a coherent um, health care policy. So, uh, give me some uh, I don't know anything about health care policy, but I thought to look into it and like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not a big fan of single payer. I think it does have its flaws in terms of putting it in this country. I don't think it would work. I think that like a multi-payer universal system, we could look into that. Uh, I think it'd be more feasible, kind of like how they do it in certain parts of Europe. Uh, Germany, for example, has one, and I know that Switzerland has like a public option type thing. And I think those would be like more feasible. I agree. We need a health care plan. We don't have it right now. And even there's some like right wing economic things that I think we could do, like opening up the state lines that would help lower the cost. So more people will be able to access it. But a lot of Americans, even like on the left, at least the voter base, mm -hmm. they do like their private health care. I just think there should be like some supplementary safety net in like an ideal world. I don't know how we would go about that. I will say this though, actually, there is some momentum building on the right that I think we could channel into a right wing healthcare policy platform in terms of like literally health. Um, like if you speak to a doctor and you tell them you have symptoms, they typically go on their laptop and they're like, oh, you need to take this drug. They never ask you about your sleeping habits, your nutrition habits, things like that. And I think that if we adopted some sort of model that you see in Europe where we actively prevent poisons from being put into our food, into our tap water, uh, the country would not be as sick and disgusting as it is now. I mean, the fact that like Americans are as fat and obese as we are now, uh, I mean, you look at like people in the 1960s, they were so effortlessly thin and they were smoking cigarettes and eating cheeseburgers and drinking milkshakes and pop. And now you have all these artificial chemicals, which I know I'm drinking canned energy. <laughs> Cut me some slack here. Uh, people are just eating things that are just like poisonous and bad for them, and their bodies do not know how to process these things. And so it just it makes them uh, inflamed and, and fat, and uh, that translates into a lot of our, our health problems. And I mean, when you look at like the top 10 causes of death in this country, a lot of them are largely preventable lifestyle related, and people are just ingesting things that are making them very sick. And that's not only their body, of course, the body is connected to the mind and to the soul. And I think a lot of the reason you see such a mentally ill, just sick country is because people are eating things and drinking things that are just terrible for them. Um, and so I don't know the intricacies of what like the actual healthcare system would be, but I know that you could make the country a lot healthier if you started dealing with what people are eating and what they're drinking. And there's residual estrogens in our tap water because of birth control got microplastic. I think it's like the average person in this country is ingesting a credit card's worth of plastic every week because of what's in your food packaging, foods, things like that. 
And those don't just like leave your body. It stays and it disrupts your hormones. Your hormones are everything. It regulates your mood, how you view the world. And you got a couple generations of that. People are gonna be really ugly, really mad. And that's just not a recipe for a healthy society. All right, so before we move on to the next question, I would like to say that I don't know much about healthcare, so I'm not gonna give a big spiel like John and Rep here, but because I'm not very up to date on it. But I think that, I think, Everybody deserves some it, some little form of healthcare, whether it be like you know you got your fat obese slob on welfare, get it. He's got. I mean, he's he's fat and disgusting, but at least but he he still needs he still needs to go go to the doctor. I mean, he needs to at least have regular checkups or something. I think one way we could fund this is not sending uh, money to all these foreign countries and other and other things like that and I just and I think that I think that where do we where do we uh, draw the line here I mean everybody everybody deserves to be to at least at least doctor visits right or at least or at least if your parents can't afford health care for you because you know you're working your blue-collar job and you know the company isn't offering isn't an offering great benefits I think at least at, at very minimum your children should have should have like great health care like just outstanding healthcare and one way we could fund it is cutting back on foreign spending that's all right go ahead all right <laughs> well today the base brandon regime blocked republican aid to israel today so i mean you know what i've noticed is that the past few months like i'll, I'll give you this example i went out to uh, my county fair a little while ago i used to be in my republican party and i was wearing a confederate flag t-shirt and I was told by this old dried out bitch, like, yeah, you can't be wearing, you can't wear that shirt over here. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Like I, I was standing in front of small businesses in 2020, protecting them when they are You're like, not a real person. <laughs> no, here's the thing. Where's Ashton Kutcher? Where's my CIA badge No, but seriously, like. It's my glow. Like, like here, like, I have been like, on the like literally like I was there and all these things I was standing against like angry hordes of BLM in 2020 I you know I went to certain protests in Washington DC you know the thing is that like when the same people that I that I basically would have spilled blood for are backstabbing me and I go to the Democrat tent it was very weird they saw my Confederate shirt and I started talking to the dude about foreign policy and stuff and he and I was like damn we're actually kind of similar and then with my confederate shirt he's like i may not agree with it but you know what i actually understand you and that was actually very interesting to hear from a like from the literal democrat stand where there was just nothing but like fag flags and all this weird dis dysgenic freaks like hanging around them there's like two or three people that were like yeah like we get it and i was like oh, dude. so i wanted to give my spiel about that but i think that working with um the uh, base Brandon regime actually can benefit us because he's pretty anti-Israel right now. And I mean, Democrats have always been kind of cowards when it comes towards foreign policy, honestly. I mean, Obama basically enabled Putin's actions in Ukraine. I mean, but you, but, but you, but you Both. still go and vote for Joe Biden after. If if it's Donald Trump, absolutely. But if it's someone like Chris Christie or some base <laughs> warmonger like uh, what? base warmonger Steve Scalise, hopefully. Yeah, uh, I'm just gonna, Steve Scalise is gonna run for president. I hope. Let me hear you. You just said you would vote for Chris Christie over Donald Trump. Absolutely, in a heartbeat. Donald Trump was the most pro-Israel candidate, in, I mean, the pro, it was pro-Israel. <laughs> I mean, you're not really going to get a hundred percent with everybody. It's oh, absolutely. No, I, I know. I know. The, the whole That's why I'm working with the base Brandon regime. Looking at the whole of like, oh. Have you given your life to Christ? Hmm? You ever, you ever considered that? Oh, I don't, I don't follow these sand religions. I, I'm a, uh, religion. I believe oh, in the oh, OG oh, uh, religion oh. of Europe. Are you a pagan? No, you're not. No, you are not a pagan. All questions will be answered, you? answered you? after the event. Oh, 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 go back to the question. Go back to the question. Next question, I'll watch you. Go well, ahead. it's okay. I'll be going with base Brandon, and we'll wave our Confederate flags right, and cool. EU I'll flags. I'll buy your plane tickets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, not that. I'll buy your tickets. Play that later with Do you think populism is an inherently revolutionary ideology? And what is your uh, opinions on accelerationism? Um, I think no it's base? inherently revolutionary in the sense that it seems to you know, be a force of revolution. 
Uh, that said, it hasn't been successful historically. Right? There's never been like a populist movement which, uh, which has been able to achieve that independently. Uh, in terms of accelerationism, no, I don't support that because it's like a very sort of like the you know the upset teenager that we mentioned earlier, where it's like oh things are going to collapse and then things will be better because I get to the fallout or then my guys will take power. The right is so disorganized. If you think if things collapse, you'd be run by Mexican drug cartels, uh, gangs of criminals, and then you'd have a few boomers with you know their ARs and their their plates and everything. They would get picked off pretty quickly, uh, and so no, it would be measurably worse. So right now the system being as it is, it is very annoying that so much of our money is just pissed away. It's very annoying that I have to see men kissing on television, but collapse would be a lot worse. So I don't really support the model of like, oh, it's going to collapse eventually, so may as well accelerate that. Uh, I think that what a, a collapse would look like in this country, with the way that it is, the amount of guns we have, the demographics we have, uh, it would be an absolute bloodbath. And I don't think that that is better than what we have now. I think that what we have now is certainly salvageable. And I don't think that we should be so uh, defeatist and sort of doom in the womb. Or I think it worse before it gets better, too. Just, like, I think that's another thing that's important that a lot of people just don't seem to realize. And it's gotten worse. It will continue to get worse. But we got to just keep our head down. We got to keep going, turn the corner, and then we can go from there. All right, final question. So over the past 60 years, we've seen a huge increase in technology. Technology's gotten that much more advanced. All sorts of AI is pretty much the leading front now after the iPhone iPhone released in 2006-ish. We've not seen a skyrocket in advancements. Phones gotten more addictive. Everyone is now effectively attached to some sort of media at all times. And propaganda campaigns are that much more effective overall. AI gets that much more intelligent. What are your thoughts on the AI influencing politics, influencing culture, influencing porn gets that much better, uh, TikTok gets that much more addictive, the average person that could maybe be on our side being diluted away from us or redirected into those vices? Yeah, I certainly think it'll have to be regulated. I also think it's interesting because with the amount of things that exist in our culture that are so backwards, the only way that you could get people to believe things like that is by having them hooked into, like you said, a constant flow of screen information, propaganda, social media, et cetera, where maybe they're just watching like Mr. Beast build Will, uh, Wells in Africa, but in between that, they're gonna see advertisers just subtly programming them to subscribe to these narratives and these beliefs. Uh, so I do think it'll have to be regulated at some point. However, there is also something to be said, the amount of work that has been done by like based right wing <coughs> video editors making edits with like Roman statues, Greek statues, things like that. So if we can get that technology on our side, look, iPad kids, Zoomers, the way the world is headed in terms of tech, in terms of technology, I don't know if we're ever going to be able to reverse that. But if in the short term we can get that on our side, that would be very positive and very effective. Imagine that propaganda apparatus has gotten people to believe things that are so backwards. And then it just like makes them believe things that are normal again. That would be awesome. So that's sort of my opinion on it. Yeah, it's the same thing with social media. It's used as a force for good. It's a force for good. If it's co-opted by our opposition, that's a problem. So I think that while it's there, I mean, we're going to have to use it to our advantage, make memes, as John pointed out, and do other things. But in the long run, I think like from just a you know principled standpoint, it is not a great thing. I think technology, in some regards, is gone too far i think a lot of people are waking up to that fact and when we do take power we're going to have to severely regulate it and listen guys i don't i don't mind us going back to you know previous technology not even we're not we're not talking about like going back to the alexander graham bell telephone but like i mean at least one of these you know what i'm saying i mean one of these you know you're not you're not doom you're not sitting on the bus doom scrolling for hours and hours i think because no one's busting out their computer to look at TikTok and youtube shorts they just are so you know, if we all had, if we just all had one of these, we we would be we'd be a lot better off. Isn't that right? 2008 playing Mad No Way Home? Isn't that just alone? digital freedom? <laughs> what? He's like, saying return to tradition, but tradition is like 2005. Yeah. True. Having like house, having your house, having everyone's house house phone like on the wall and in the. In the Kitchen, landline. yeah, landline, whatever, man. Um, that wouldn't, be, that wouldn't be that bad either. But I'm just saying, like, like the most basic thing, if we were to revert technology, is right there. Windows XP and blog. Windows XP and blog. Said. Said. Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. 
All right. And that concludes our defining population panel. Thank you, everybody.